welcome. My name is Stacy Eichert. I'm one of the associate pastors at Westlake Hills Presbyterian Church, where we exist to invite people into God's larger story as we follow Christ together. There are a number of things happening in the life of our church. I want to invite you to look at the front page of our website at the button that says Reconnect Connect Lent 2021. If you click that button, you'll find all of the things that are happening during Lent, things you can register for, a Lent class, Bible studies, reconnect groups. Go to that place and find a way that you can reconnect this Lent. You'll also find on our website all kinds of information about our student ministries. They are having special one-day retreats uh, for middle school, for high school. Go and pay attention to that and look at um, what our students can do to get more connected and to get uh, involved. We are 10 days away now from Lent. Ash Wednesday is on Wednesday, the 17th of February. And on that day, starting at 9 a.m., there will be a special Ash Wednesday service that you can get to from our website. Hope that you'll join us for that. But we'll also, here in our church parking lot, be having drive-through Ash Imposition and Communion. So we invite you to come to our upper parking lot between 11 and 1, and then again between 4 and 6 on Ash Wednesday. Everyone who comes will also receive the Lenten journal that has been prepared just for us uh, to go along with our sermons and our studies so that as a congregation, we can get involved in what's happening in Lent. Um, Hope to see you that day. Put it on your calendar. There's a lot more happening Um, and our church, a lot going on virtually. So please visit our app or our website for more information. Friends, there are many things to invite you to be a part of, many things going on in the life of the church, but that's not why you are here, and that's not why I'm here. Right now, in this place and time, we're here because God has called us to be here. God calls us for praise and worship. God calls us reminding us who we are. And most importantly, God calls us to be made new and redeemed. Today, our tough question has to do with sin and forgiveness. So let us gather with honesty about our lives and with bright hope for God's forgiveness. Friends, join me now as together We call ourselves to worship with this, our memory verse. But you, O Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, and the one who lifts up my head. I cry aloud to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy hill.
together our prayer of confession. Please join me. God of love, you are the source of every blessing. You are our hope and our help along the road of life. Still so often we are inclined to forget you. We dismiss your gracious companionship, believing we can go it alone, make our own way, but we have wandered far from righteousness. Alone in the wilderness of sin, we need rescue. We need forgiveness. We need redemption. Merciful God, save us now. Gather us in and nurture us with your grace that we might grow ever more into your likeness that we might live as your beloved children, showing forth your love for the world. Hear now the silent confessions of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do not fear, says the Lord, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. God is doing a new thing. See, it springs forth. Know that in Jesus Christ you are forgiven and be at peace. And let all of us say together, Amen.
forgiven what peace floods our hearts. Let us share that peace with one another. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Well, hey, good morning. It's good to see all of you, even though I actually can't see you. I know you're there, and that encourages me, and I can't wait for the day we get to all hang out. Well, today I was outside, and I was just thinking about something, because you know we've been doing this tough question series, and I actually started thinking about my dog, Levi. This is Levi. Levi, say hello to the people. Levi, he's a puppy, although, if you can see him, he's about 85 pounds. I know, and he's only six months old. He is going to be a big dog. And I started thinking about this question, because Levi, guess what? As a puppy, he's messing up all the time. He's barking when he's not supposed to. He's jumping on the counter and trying to eat our food. He's chewing up all my socks. And he keeps messing up, no matter how many times I try to teach him something different. And guess what? Every time Levi messes up, do I get mad? I might get a little frustrated, but you know what? I still love the guy, and I just want him to do better and be a good dog. And so we treat him, and we hang out with him, and we love on him. And hopefully, he keeps becoming, getting to be a better and better dog, and these puppy days are behind us, because I am running out of socks to wear. But this made me think about something, because you know what? Just like Levi, I actually mess up too. In fact, I mess up a lot, and I bet you've messed up a couple times too. Maybe even you've messed up a lot too. It just happens, right? We're trying to do good. Just like Levi, he's trying to be a good dog. But sometimes his puppy energy gets the best of him. Like right now, he's trying to chew up the handle. But here's the deal. Here's what I was thinking about. Because did you know that even when you mess up, it doesn't change the way God feels about you? God loves you so much that there's nothing that you can do that would change how much he loves you. And that's an incredible fact. So here's what I want you to think about this week. The next time you messed up and maybe you're a little embarrassed or maybe you're even frustrated or, or maybe you're, you're kind of scared because maybe there's gonna be a punishment. I want you to remember one thing, that God doesn't stop and look at you and go, oh, what a failure. I can't believe that happened again. No way. He looks at you with the same amount of love and he knows that you're gonna grow. Just like I look at Levi and I go, oh, you did it again. I go, oh, you know what? You're a puppy. You're gonna figure it out. It's no big deal. This is the right way. Let me show you. It's exactly how God works with us. So I want you to know this. There is nothing you can do that would change how God 
feels about you. And the way he feels about you is he loves you very, very, very much. So this week when you mess up, it's okay to feel a little disappointed. It's okay to feel all the different feelings that you might feel, but I want you to remember one thing. God loves you and he's cheering you on. And he says, hey, it's okay to make a mistake. I forgive you. Let's figure it out this next time. And he wants to go with you and walk with you as you continue to figure it out. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for um, just the fact that you love us. And you know that we're humans and that we're going to make mistakes. Just like I know my dog Levi is a puppy and he's going to make mistakes. It just happens. But in those mistakes, you don't love us any less. And in fact, you love us so much that you walk alongside us and you say, don't worry about it. We'll figure this out together. And I'm so thankful for that. Help us to remember that the next time we make a mistake. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Tara Westover started her new life on New Year's Day. Her mother drove her from rural Idaho to start college at Brigham Young University and start her formal education at the age of 16. I say formal education because up until that moment, Tara Westover was not allowed to go to school. And so she had packed for her first semester of college. She took one of those big black garbage bags and filled it with clothes and then took a dozen cans of her mama's peaches. Her roommates that she was to meet, they were still away on their Christmas break. And so she settled into her apartment by herself for three days. The first roommate to arrive was Shannon. She, she writes, she was wearing plush pink pajama bottoms and a tight white tank with spaghetti straps. Tara writes, I stared at her bare shoulders. I had seen women dressed this way before. Dad called them Gentiles. And I always avoided getting too near them as if their immorality might be catching. Now there was one in my house Tara Westover is the woman who wrote her 2018 autobiography titled Educated. She tells her unique upbringing story by a father with extreme fundamentalist Mormon views. For Tara, sin was defined as whatever her father said was sin. The government, hospitals, schools, doctors, but also any form of immodesty in dress, talk, or action. And her father had taught her that if you got too close to anybody that was participating in anything like that, or too close to one of those institutions, you would be likely to sin as well. What were you taught about sin as a child? For our parents today, is this something you even teach your children? As a teenager, I learned that sin with a capital S was what separates humans from God. And that because of Jesus, I could not be separated from God anymore because my big S had died up on the cross but I could still do little s sins. Little s sins were things one could choose to do or not to do bad things that, that God didn't approve of or your parents didn't approve of, like lying or cheating on a test, swearing, getting drunk, having sex before marriage, etc. And if I was to sin little s in these ways, there would be consequences, both in this world and from God. And so as a pleaser, I hated getting in trouble. And so I tried my best not to do these things. Really, just so that I wouldn't get in trouble and I would stay on God's good side. 
As I grew up and I gained more independence, I realized that if I did some of these bad things, though, I didn't always get in trouble and there wasn't always an immediate consequence. I would see how maybe my ugliness towards my siblings or towards a friend would affect their well-being. So my understanding of sin, it, it began to move from something that I just tried my best not to do so that I wouldn't get in trouble to things that I should do to make sure that I always feel good and other people always feel good. All of the while, y'all, this understanding of sin that I had, it was, it was really more of a scorecard and I just needed to make sure that I had more checks in the not sin column than I did in the sin column. One of the many problems was the, with this was that when I tried my best not to sin and not to hurt others, I still somehow managed to do so. I remember specifically in high school being flabbergasted when a friend came up to me and explained to me how hurt she was that I had not invited her to a party the weekend before. And, and I looked at her and I said, well, one, I didn't even know that you were wanted to go to that party, but two, it wasn't my party to invite you to. And what this led to in that 16-year-old mind for me was this new way of living. If I am trying my best to not mess up, and yet I still am doing so, I must just need to try harder. Fast forward a few decades. Charlie and I have these two children, Logan and Riley at this point, and we let Logan and Riley go to a week of Christian sleepaway camp. And I say we let them because we waited until it was the, you send one and you get the second one to go for free deal. They both had this fabulous time at this camp. The week after camp, I'm hanging out with the boys and I accidentally stepped on Logan's foot. And after he says, ow, he looks at me and he says, that's okay, mama, everyone sins. This was a turning point in my faith, in my parenting, in my self-awareness. Keep in mind, I've already been to seminary. I've already been in ministry for 10 years. I realized at that moment that not only did I need to make sure that my kids knew what sin really meant, whether it was big S or little s, I needed to make sure that I knew what it meant. Much of our definition and understanding of sin comes from what we learned or what we were taught when we were younger, or at least how our brains processed it when we were younger by Sunday school teachers, confirmation teachers, parents, and yes, Christian camp. And so our tough question for God today is what is the deal with sin? Now before our scripture reading, I want to make sure that you have a pen and, piece of, pen and a piece of paper or get out the notes section in your phone. And every time you hear something, whether in the scripture or in the sermon, that, that makes you ask another question or want to dive deeper, write that down. And all of those questions that you have, you can bring to Pastor Claire tomorrow night when she is our Monday night speaker series and is going to dive deep, deeper than we can in a, a sermon on what is the deal with sin. To help us answer this question today, we will look at the Apostle Paul and his letter to the church in Rome. Before we read this, will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, all of us have sinned and fallen short of your glory, but thanks be to God that we have all been forgiven and can boldly approach you, try to fumble around with our words and our life, knowing that there is absolutely nothing that can ever separate us from your love. And so with all humility, God, I, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be pleasing and acceptable to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We're reading from Romans chapter 6, starting at verse 1. What then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus 
were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death. So that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And skip down to verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I wonder if you are drawn to the way this scripture reads with the rhetorical questions and these emphatic answers. If you are drawn to that, I wanna encourage you to go and read more of this beautiful letter from the Apostle Paul to the church in Rome. In the beginning of my ministry, one of my favorite parts was teaching confirmation to eighth grade students. I wanted to introduce them to theological concepts in ways that were so approachable that they would be able to talk to any aged person about big things, you know, like the Trinity. And so I got out the the Aquafresh toothpaste, you know, the one that has the three colors And we would all put out a row of this Aquafresh toothpaste and then I would give them a toothpick and I'd tell them to try to separate the three colors and they would get so frustrated because it's virtually impossible to separate the three colors. And I would say, just like the Trinity, you can't separate the Father from the Son from the Spirit. Now stick with me, y'all, because I know that every single analogy when it comes to the holy and the eternal things, it breaks down at some point. So when I was trying to explain the deal with sin, I would use the big S sin for this separation from God and the little S sin, just like I was taught. I wanted to emphasize that no matter what we do, we needed to realize like Paul writes in verse 14, we are not under law, we are under grace. Like Like Kyle just said in the faith sharing, I wanted these kids to realize this immense love of God. I didn't want them ever to leave confirmation class. Like I don't ever want you to leave a worship service feeling condemned. Because scripture is so clear. There is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. So I wanted to make this very visible for them. And so I would hand out these pieces of paper and on them, I would tell them to write their sin and that no one would see what it is. So it, pride, jealousy, cheating, discontentment, whatever it is. And then I would place it in this bowl and it would have, you know, 30 pieces of paper in it. And then I would just say, look, y'all, when, when we come before God and we confess our sins, He forgives them and remembers them no more. It was this like powerful example and all the kids would be wowed. They wanna know what that is and can they get their hands on some of that flash magic paper. But I have been thinking so much about how I wish I could go back and redo that lesson. I realize that that analogy does an incredible job of demonstrating the loving character of God. God loves, God forgives, God does not hold our transgressions against him. But you know, it keeps God at arm's length from our lives. It doesn't allow God into our decision-making and critical thinking. It keeps God on the outside waiting for us to come to him when we need to or want something. We just do the sin and then we can go to God and ask for forgiveness. And so God becomes like an awesome grandparent, someone we know would do anything for us, no matter what we do, but doesn't expect to hear from us a lot. 
we'll share our desires and struggles. And as, as far as sin goes, well, we'll just do our best not to do the big ones most of the time. Church, this is not the deal with sin. Paul writes, how can we who died to sin go on living in it? He writes, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Now that's a word we don't like to talk about, death. In Luke 9, 23, Jesus says, if anyone wants to follow me, they must take up their cross, deny themselves daily and follow. When we follow Christ, we are making a decision to do something totally countercultural. Cultural. It's sociologically counterintuitive. We make a decision to be on a journey of continual transformation. And this means some things in our lives, our hearts, and our minds have to die. We cannot keep God at arm's length, just continuing to live as we please or what we think pleases others, and then come to God when it's convenient. This following Jesus thing, this being a Christian thing, it is active and alive. Did you see all the action words in this passage? Live in, buried with, baptized into. Paul writes, we need to be presenting ourselves to God It's an ongoing minute by minute, day by day relationship with God, a God who desires to transform us from the inside out. I want you to consider how much time we focus on transforming the outside. We focus on how our skin looks. We want no acne, we want less wrinkles, we have fillers here and there. Some of us want fuller hair, others want less hair. We want our clothes to be fashionable. And we want people to look at them and say, we look sharp, attractive, handsome, maybe even sexy. We want our homes to be dialed in, to look put together, for it all to be just right. And by golly, we are going to make sure that whatever we post on social media makes our outside appearance of our life Well, something that will make us get likes and make us feel like things are really going to be just right. The Apostle Paul reminds us that if we want to walk in newness of life, in freshness of life, if we want that sense that things are going to be just right, it will only come from being transformed from the inside out. Imagine with me using just 10% of the energy and focus that we put towards our outside image and we shift that focus to engaging with the creator of the universe. It would be a tithe of our time each day. Given to God to pray, to read scripture, to journal, to reflect, to do that inner work and let the spirit of God work within us. Consider it takes you 30 minutes to get ready. That's three minutes or it's 45 minutes. Shower like my boys, four and a half minutes. God does not want to be kept at arm's length from our lives. Paul writes, we have been buried with Jesus by baptism into death. Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. I want to walk in newness of life in a way that is fresh, being transformed continually by the Holy Spirit. May it be so in my life and in yours. Amen.
Our senior staff and our session gathered to hear the statements of faith of our incoming officers, our elders and our deacons. And then after we held their ordination and installation service virtually, I now want to invite you to participate with them. And when Pastor Claire begins her prayer and invites you to raise your hands towards the screen, I invite you to participate. God has called each of you by the voice of this church to serve Jesus Christ in a special way. You know who we are and what we believe, and you understand the work for which you have been chosen. We ask you now to answer the following questions. Do you trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, do you? 
I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you? Do you? I do. I do. I do. I do. I do. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church? as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? Do you? Mm -hmm. I do. Will you fulfill your offense and obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of scripture and continually guided by our confessions? Will you? I will. I will. I will. Will you be governed by our church's polity and abide by its discipline? And will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them and subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you? I will. I will. Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Will you? I will. I will. I will. Will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you? Will. Will. And do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Do you? I do. I do. I do. To the elders, the five of you, I ask you these two questions. I ask you this one question. Will you be a faithful elder? watching over the people and providing for their worship, nurture, and service. Will you? I will. And will you share in government and discipline serving in the governing bodies of the church? Will you? I will. I will. And to the deacons, will you be a faithful deacon teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and to those in need? Will you? Will. Through your life and ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? I will. I will. And now to the members of the congregation, do we, the members of Westlake Hills Presbyterian Church, accept these elders and deacons chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ? Do we? We do. 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 do we agree to encourage them to respect their decisions and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? Do we? We do. We do. We do. We do. We do. We do. I now would like to ask all of those to be ordained to please kneel if able or just sit is fine. Sitting is absolutely fine. The laying on of hands, if, if I could have one of you hold up your stole so they could see the hands that are laid on them. Three of our church members, Cheryl Strider Becker, Charlotte Nepp, and Diane Hansen made these stoles for you all. And each of those represents a hand, a virtual hand. We wish that we could have our current elders and deacons and those that have previously been ordained to lay hands on you. But those have been prayed over by those three women. And now we will pray for you virtually as we, the best we can. The laying on of hands is a visible gesture. It symbolizes empowerment through spiritual gifts and the sharing of responsibility for ministry within the church. All of us are invited to participate. Claire Berry will be offering our prayer of ordination and installation. Let us pray. Almighty God, in every age you have chosen servants to speak your word and lead your people. We thank you for these men and women who you have called to serve your church. Grant to them the gifts of your spirit that they might be faithful in their tasks. Give us courage and discipline to follow where they rightly lead us 
that together we may declare your wonderful deeds and show your love to the world. Through Jesus Christ, the Lord of all. Amen. And now let us all pray together the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, 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 hallowed be, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, to come. Thy will be done, will be done on earth, on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this, this, this day. day. Our debts are debts, as we forgive, we forgive our, our debts, and lead us, and lead us not into temptation, temptation, but deliver us, us from evil. evil. Thine is the kingdom, the is the kingdom and the power, and the, power, and the glory, and the glory forever. forever. Amen. Amen. I love how that finished, and I didn't mute any one person, because it made me feel that awkwardness that we always feel when we do this prayer, and we ask everybody that's present to pray out loud. And some people are, are maybe shy about their prayers. Some are um, done very quickly. And then there's the, the one person that is the last voice heard. And, and this is a beautiful cacophony of the prayers that have been prayed over each of you this day. Friends, you are now elders and deacons in the Church of Jesus Christ and for this Presbyterian congregation. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God through him. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please join me in singing together. the definition of sin. It is those little things that we do that we know God does not want us. It is also this fact that sin is what separates us from God. But friends, it's not so simple as just not doing those things, creating some type of checklist. God desires to be interacting with our very beings to be transforming us from the inside out more into the likeness of his son, Jesus. Will you join me this week, tithing your time spent on all the things that other people can see and giving that to God to allow God the time to transform us more into his likeness. May you go from this place with new life, taking the struggles of the past, the busyness of the present the hopes of the future as stepping stones on this journey of faith. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, amen. <laughs>